Welcome everyone to uh, day two of ACTC's 2021 undergraduate conference. I am Charlie Thomas, uh, executive director of ACTC. And uh, I am very pleased this morning uh, to introduce our three speakers. Um, actually, uh, I will introduce them briefly, but I, I hope each of you will um, introduce yourselves before you give the paper, just uh, uh, you know, your name, of course, but also where you're coming from, um, perhaps what you're studying. Uh, uh, our, we'll go in the order of the, of the program. Um, so that's uh, Nick Elliott. Uh, Chandler Gard and then uh, Benjamin Kennan. Um, and we'll, we'll save questions to the end um, for all three. So please, you know, it, uh, we don't want to neglect uh, to ask questions about Nick's paper just because it's the most uh, distant from the Q&A. Uh, so please, you know, take a few notes um, as, as we go through so that when we get to the end, um, we'll have questions and conversation that includes includes everyone. Um, all right. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Nick Elliott from Amsterdam University College. His uh, paper is entitled "Reorienting Utopianism: The Value of Classical Utopian Thought in Achieving Positive Social and Political Change in the 21st Century." Welcome, Nick. Hey, yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm studying at Amsterdam University College in, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Um, so yeah, I've got a bit of a time difference, uh, but it's worked out quite nicely today, to be honest. I haven't had to be up so early. Um, but yeah, as, as, uh, 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 as it was mentioned, um, my paper is entitled We Are Into Utopianism, The Value of Classical Utopian Thought in Achieving Positive Social and Political Change in the 21st Century. Um, so yeah, I guess I probably just get to reading it. Um, hope you guys can follow along. If I'm going too fast or, or too quietly or whatever, just let me know. Uh, and yeah, hope you enjoy. <laughs> the exciting idealism of utopias have long intrigued some of humanity's most profound thinkers, and perhaps more frequently, the armchair philosophers amongst us. Oscar Wilde observed how, and I quote, a map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. Indeed, many intellectual pursuits have found their motivation in the fundamental spirit of utopianism, which asks questions of how it should be as, a mere, as opposed to merely how it is. At the end of the 20th, 20th century, utopian sentiments experienced a real decline in popularity as a backlash from their popularized connection with totalitarian regimes on both the right and the left. This decline in perceived value of utopianism in society was experienced by academics writing at the time. Francis Fukuyama in his work, The End of History and the Last Man, observed what he deemed to be the end point of mankind's ideological evolution under liberal democracy, which he famously called the end of history. However, since the turn of the century, a radical rebirth of scholarship has occurred around what I refer to as the utopian process in which thinkers have attempted to reorient the popular understanding of utopianism. One question that has received considerable critical attention is that of how the utopian process should be reinterpreted so that we might renew its utility in achieving positive social and political change in the 21st century. It is within this specific academic discourse on utopianism that my own interests fall. Existing research on this topic recognizes the immense value of utopian thought towards positive progression in the fields of philosophy, politics, and sociology particularly. The search for novel functional interpretations of the utopian process has thus been prioritized by scholars in the field. This search has resulted in some important postulations of how utopianism can be implemented in contemporary culture, or as the prominent utopian scholar Ruth Levitas puts it, how we might look for the blue. Levitas, along with other late 20th and early 21st century utopian thinkers, have often approached their research with a clean slate from which they develop their novel understanding of utopianism. Consequently, there has been little discussion about the foundational core utopian texts and how they might aid the pursuit of increasing utopianism's utility in contemporary society. As a solution to this apparent short-sightedness, I thought it would be useful to explore a traditional core utopian text, namely Christine de Pizan's book of the City of Ladies, written in the 15th century, 
in order to help develop a renewed understanding of utopianism and Levitas's analytic conception. A bit of background on Levitas. Levitas' theory on utopia's method constitutes one of the most important contributions to this field of research. Building upon the work of Ernst Bloch and his support of the necessity of utopianism as explored in his magnum opus, The Principle of Hope, Levitas carves a new path for the use value and implementation of utopianism in the 21st century. She proposes that utopia should be regarded as a journey and not a goal, thus implementing a methodological framework into the way in which utopia is encountered and utilized today. Levitas' argument here shows real signs of reinvigorating the utopian thrust both in our political and social lives, and is, I would argue, a modern core text within utopian scholarship. However, in insisting the novelty of her ideas, Levitas has engaged in her intellectual pursuit in a similar way to her contemporaries and has negated the value of traditional utopian literature and core texts. As I mentioned, one of Levitas' key contribution to the development of a novel understanding of utopianism is her shift to understanding to this idea of viewing utopia as a method. She posits that utopianism is a socially constructed phenomenon which arises exactly between the perceived gap between our socially constructed need and our socially available means of satisfaction. Because these two criteria are socially and personally subjective, Levitas rejects the idea of utopias as solely comprising of blueprint universal utopias, the achievement of which might be regarded as the ultimate societal goal in traditional utopian texts such as Thomas More's Utopia. Instead, she advocates for utopianism to be considered a method through which we can become aware of the exact gap between our social societal expectations and the reality of how these might be achieved. What we can observe here is that the utopian scheme of thought requires to a certain degree, a suspension of the political, which is trained on such practically practical and sharply focused issues. With this suspension, we could take unimaginable mental liberties when considering societal restructuring which would simply not be possible within the realm of standard constrained political thought. Thus for Levitas, utopianism can be viewed as an analytical method of thought and not a descriptive one, which can allow us to escape practicality and release the constraints on our social and political imagination. Indeed, Levitas argument builds on the supposition that utopianism has until her theory only consisted of blueprint descriptive utopias. Contrary to the supposed novelty of her own developments, I believe that this analytical methodological formulation of utopianism which at, was actually present in traditional utopias. Christine de Pizan's motivation for writing The City of Ladies is suggested to be her reading of a novel given to her, which enforced an immoral and weak betrayal of women and their values to society, which clearly upset Christine herself. Thus, in response to her upset, she sets out on a mission to conceive of a city entirely run by women, notably some of the most prominent women in human history. This reads as being highly humorous, and I think it's humor that I believe Christine desired, as it serves to demonstrate the exact foolishness of those who attempt to disregard an entire sex or half the population in their constitution of society. In this way, Christine herself clearly uses utopianism as a method. The city of ladies is described as being a state of sheer perfection, and Christine goes to extensive lengths to clarify the working practicalities of the city. However, she ultimately does not intend for this city to come into being. Instead, it is an ironic rhetoric for reflecting upon the moral illnesses faced by women in her time at the hand of men. In the City of Ladies, we recognize a key value of understanding utopia as a method, namely that Christine was able to criticize a feature of society that it was simply unacceptable to criticize in the time that she was writing. Considering Lev Levitas' theory, Christine appears to observe the perceived gap between her socially constructed need and her socially available means of satisfaction, thus providing a utopian insight on a foolish shortcoming of society. In the attempt to recover utopianism and reestablish its importance in society, it is also important to consider why it has frequently been criticized and why a return to classical core utopian texts such as the City of Ladies might be able to rescue it from its critics. John Gray in 2007 discussed the potential dangers of utopianism and its implementation in contemporary society and culture. Gray criticized the unreality of utopian thought and insisted that the utopian lack of boundaries on human imagination would lead only to the formation of a dystopia as he believed it happened under Marxist communism. 
Gray's approach to utopianism comprises of the common view of viewing utopia as a blueprint, which if carried out, necessitates dismantling existing social institutions, thus mirroring and even surpassing what he calls traditional tyrannies. In response to Gray's critique of utopianism, Levitas, amongst other scholars, argues that Gray's anti-utopianism targets a highly specific formulation of utopia and leads only to a highly conservative politics of realism. Levitas puts forward the position that John Gray must reject all imaginary narratives of social development as incipiently utopian insofar as they require, require the imagination of human progress and societal reconstitution. In this important debate, one can observe the fact that the discussion around utopian thought is so often marred by a dialogue between the politics of conservatism put forward by Gray's anti-utopianism, facing what many would describe as Levitas neo-Marxism, a position which she herself proclaims, put forward by her utopianism. This has resulted in a decreased appreciation of utopian thought as a result of people fearing its political implications and ties. This marks another key area where classical core utopian texts such as the City of Ladies might be able to help. Indeed, the fact that the City of Ladies was written before the rise of Marxism, liberalism and conservatism provides it with a fresh approach to utopian thought that has been disregarded by recent scholars in the field. If one is to explore the utopianism present in the City of Ladies, it is possible to observe that Christine's utopianism has no apparent political goal other than the specific issue to which it refers to, namely the treatment of women. This leads me to the conclusion that the core traditional utopian texts may serve another crucial purpose in the reorientation of utopianism in the 21st century. Namely, they demonstrate that an apolitical formulation of utopianism may indeed be possible, thus allowing utopianism to be used on sharply focused social issues without collapsing into a dystopian nightmare, as Gray has suggested. The assumption of critics such as Gray that utopianism is a wholly destructive, is wholly destructive in solely proposing a complete new blueprint order for society is undoubtedly short-sighted. This is due to its lack of appreciation of a more nuanced utopianism, as it is clearly in pre present in a host of traditional utopian core texts. In summary, if we take Levitas' conception of utopia as method and observe the case study of Christine de Pizan's City of Ladies, we are confronted with a utopianism which can have real practical use in achieving positive change whilst avoiding many of the entrenched political debates. Utopianism, utopianism has become far too politicized to the point at which it has lost all elements of scale. One is either fully utopian or not utopian at all. In recent times, we have witnessed a distinct lack of political and social innovation as a result of the COVID pandemic and its strangulation effect on society. This combined with the rise of conservatism in political systems across the globe has resulted in a profound need for a positive and change oriented mindset, one that utopianism can provide. Through a reorientation of utopianism through de Pizan's insights, we might be able to start reconstituting how we wish society to be as we leave, the society as we leave this pandemic behind us and not merely how it will look. Moreover, in a time when the global political spectrum is thoroughly polarized, it is of real value to demonstrate how Christine's utopianism is not plagued by modern entrenched political distinctions and can instead be a force for change for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about that. Uh, you guys are gonna have to hold me back if you wanna uh, get into this conversation. Uh, but next, uh, we have uh, um, coming up uh, Chandler Gard from St. Thomas University. And the title of his paper is On Gunpowder as a Cure for COVID-19. I'm a little frightened, Chandler, but the, the floor is yours. Maybe rightfully so. Let's get right into it. <laughs> uh, historically, the consolidation of power during times of adversity is not uncommon. In the face of modern adversity, in the form of the COVID-19 pandemic, rulers have turned towards a consolidation of power. Public health guidelines have become law, and the officials of the former have been given po political power as advisors. The question that arises out of this consolidation is whether modern leaders have become despotic in their efforts to combat the pandemic. In contrast to the despotic, characterized by ruling out of turn, is the political, wherein those who are free participate in both ruling and being ruled in turn. 
In Gulliver's Travels, Swift exemplifies both the despotic through the Lilliputians, who use force and tyrannical laws to exert their will, and politics through the king of Brobdingnag, who practices tolerance, patience, and ruling in turn. In comparing the response to COVID-19 by modern rulers to the regimes and characters of Gulliver's Travels, characteristics of despotism will be revealed. In a voyage to Lilliput, after returning to consciousness from a nap, Gulliver has his first encounter with the Lilliputians. He says of the first that he sees, that it is a human creature, not six inches high, with a bow and arrow in his hands and a quiver at his back. Gulliver also finds himself bound to the ground. We are later told that upon the first moment Gulliver was discovered sleeping on the ground after his landing, the emperor had early notice of it by express and determined by council that Gulliver should be tied. Surely such a response is reasonable given the stature of the Lilliputians in comparison to Gulliver. It could be argued that the Lilliputians feared for the security of their country and people before the giant Gulliver, and so they sought to forcefully subdue him to ensure the safety of the public. Once the Lilliputians ceased firing arrows at him, Gulliver turned and saw a stage erected about a foot and a half from the ground, upon which the Lilliputian authorities used to deliver a long speech, whereof Gulliver understood not one syllable. In behaving so, the Lilliputians aim to make Gulliver aware of his place before them. It is the place of an inferior. The stage is erected so that he must look at, up at them instead of down, and the speeches are given despite his inability to understand. This shows that the speeches are not meant for Gulliver's understanding, but for the Lilliputians to exhibit their authority. It is not until the speeches are done that Gulliver is given the opportunity to attend to the demands of nature, meaning that Gulliver's most basic needs are less important to the Lilliputians than their extravagant and lengthy speeches. In this encounter, one can see how the Lilliputians deal with potentially threatening individuals and to the needs of such individuals. They respond with arrows, ropes, and lengthy incomprehensible speeches. If one were still able to argue that such a response was appropriate given the threat Gulliver represents, one might turn instead to the greater conflict which the Lilliputians are a part of, the civil war with Blefescu. Gulliver is told that the origin of the conflict is over a law legislated by the emperor of Lilliput which betrayed ancient practices. The law commanded all the emperor's subjects upon great penalty to break the smaller end of their eggs. The reasoning being that while breaking an egg by the larger end, the emperor's grandfather had cut himself. It was this tyrannical law which betrayed ancient tradition that caused the people of Blefescu to rebel. The regime had overstepped its public authority and aimed to control the private practice of egg cracking. Necessarily, Blefescu being unwilling to conform to the state's new despotic law and the emperor being unwilling to revert the law the two parties have engaged in a most obstinate war for six and 30 moons. If the intent of the law was to protect the emperor's subjects from the potential harms of egg cracking, then it is odd that the emperor aims to harm those citizens who digress from public egg cracking guidelines. Here, Swift shows the des that despotic laws demand despotic enforcement and that some will not tolerate it. In direct contrast to the Lilliputian response to threatening individuals and those of differing views, Swift presents in the voyage of Brobdingnag a giant and tolerant people. In Brobdingnag, Gulliver faced perpetual threats of being stepped on, stolen by monkeys, or eaten by rats. The king and Gulliver's personal guardian, or as he learned to call her, Glumdalklich, actively sought to protect him from the physical harms that he might have endured. But the threat was not just from the non-rational beings of Brobdingnag. When told that Gulliver would be brought to the king's court, Glumdalklich protested, fearing that some mischief would happen to him from vulgar folks who might squeeze him to death or break one of his limbs. The people of Brobdingnag themselves pose a constant danger to Gulliver. Because of this, he attempts to refrain from a reciprocal political relationship with them. Instead, seeking to exert precisely what, the Lillip what Lilliput sought over Gulliver, a despotic relationship. In both cases, fear motivated action, and in both cases, despotism was the product. Clearly, political rule must be grounded in something else, and fear should not be allowed to rule out of turn. Just as Gulliver was a giant to the Lilliputians, both physically and morally, so are the Brobdingnagians giant to Gulliver. In these two examples, it is the inferior being who pursue a despotic rule over the superior. 
In this way, the pursuit of despotism can be seen as an inferior pursuit to the political. The pursuit, the, the pursuit of despotism might then be used as a flag for injustice or an unjust cause. There is no greater exhibition of political rule in the text than that shown by the King of Brobdingnag to Gulliver in their various discourses. Unlike the Lilliputians, the small Gulliver was not in a position to tie down and stand over the Brobdingnagians, and so he sought his despotism in different ways. The king ordered an arrangement so that Gulliver could give him an exact account of the government of England as he possibly could, in hopes of discovering something worth imitation. In contrast to the Lilliputians who built a platform over Gulliver and delivered speeches in a language he did not know, the king would have Gulliver set upon the table in the king's closet so that they might have a conversation face to face. The conversation was not ended under five audiences, each of several hours, and the king heard the whole with great attention, frequently taking notes of what Gulliver spoke, as well as memorandums of what questions he intended to ask. Through and through, the king exhibits patience while Gulliver speaks. While the king sought a truthful conversation, Gulliver aimed to hide the frailties and deformities of his political mother and place her virtues and beauties in the most advantageous light. This was his sincere endeavor in those many discourses he had with that monarch, although it unfortunately failed of success. Not only does Gulliver fail in his intended mission to deceive the king into believing his homeland to be beautiful, he also fails to give the king what the king wanted a truthful account that might deserve imitation. Like the Lilliputian emperor who subdued Gulliver by mixing sleeping potions with hogshead wine, Gulliver attempts to deceive the king into believing Gulliver and his homeland are greater than they are in hopes of gaining favor and leverage over the king. He failed in this endeavor, much like the Lilliputians failed to control Gulliver and their rebellious subjects. To the careful reader, Swift is outlining a pattern. Despotism is an unstable relationship and is not sought and is sought by ignoble means. With Gulliver's attempts at deception thwarted, he makes one last effort to show the king the glory and innovation of his homeland. He offers the king the knowledge of gunpowder with the promise that it would batter down the walls of the strongest town in his dominion in a few hours or destroy the whole metropolis if ever it should pretend to dispute his absolute commands. Here, the difference of minds between the king and Gulliver is on full display. Gulliver believes himself to be giving the king the greatest opportunity, or at least the greatest opportunity according to Gulliver and the Lilliputians, absolute control. Given the efforts of the king thus far to do everything possible to ensure a proper and fair rule, it comes as no surprise that the king was struck with horror at the description Gulliver had given of those terrible engines and the proposal Gulliver had made. The king's resilience in the face of Gulliver's offer speaks to the effort that he is willing to exert to maintain a political rule within the confines of justice over free and willing individuals. Gulliver, however, not seeing the dangers of this proposal, attributes the king's outrage with it to his narrow principles and short views. Gunpowder would serve the king insofar as ruling would be left exclusively to him, without question. Instead, the king desires politics and knows no reason why those who entertain opinions prejudicial to the public should be obliged to change. Despotism takes many forms. In contrast to it stands politics and ruling and being ruled in turn. When the business person on their stage of money yells at the scientists and doctors that the economy will not survive the restriction, and the scientists and doctors yell back on their stage of books that we will not survive without the restriction, both resemble the Lilliputians yelling at an uncomprehending Gulliver. The pandemic is frightening. That does not mean fear should govern us. For policy grounded in fear, as shown by Swift, necessarily becomes despotic. Gulliver's offer of absolute control should be declined, even by the expert projectors who promise to build a mill fitter for motion. They might just as easily build a ruin and lay the blame elsewhere. The King of Brobdingnag has been missing so far in the pandemic, but one can hope that he will come and set us in our box upon his closet, almost level to his face. Such a person would not need ropes to tie down a threatening individual or a stage to prioritize speeches over the demands of nature. Instead, eggs would be cracked, conversations had, and adversity resolved. Thank you.
Thanks, Chandler. We may have some connections between um, Swift and the utopian process to, uh, <laughs> to discuss in a few minutes. Uh, but first, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Trip Kinnan, Benjamin W. Kinnan uh, of Mercer University. Uh, his paper, the third and last in our panel, so you guys get ready for some conversation, um, is the empiricism of Hume addresses the skepticism medical professionals face today. Trip, welcome, floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, hi again, I'm coming from Macon, Georgia, and I'm a uh, PPE uh, major here. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna start my paper. The pandemic has brought about many side effects other than disease. Um, the most startling one is the resurgence of radical skepticism, especially towards the medical community. Um, people have lost trust in the professionals. As fear over the pandemic grew, so did the distrust over who is educated or equipped enough to direct a course of action. As a result of the fear and the distrust, people began turning towards rationalizing speculative theories. For example, the misinformation about how the vaccine can cause infertility amongst people who take it. However deeply seated this philosophy has become during COVID-19, it does not go unanswered. Just as Hume replied to Descartes' fears and skepticism about God, the same reasoning can be applied to how skeptical theories are formed about the healthcare industry. It's from his construction on how we attain knowledge that we can not only show the construction of speculative theories, but how to lay them to rest. Before showing uh, how Hume addresses skepticism, it's important to show the philosophical bedrock of today's skeptical theories. The root of today's modern, modern skepticism like all skeptical theories, comes from a disbelief in the presented truth for some hidden one. It is from the catalyst of disbelief that the connection between presented fact and speculative theory become mixed. Take the theory that the vaccine makes people infertile, for example. The basis for the sterility theory comes from the belief that the messenger RNA within the vaccine could attack a protein within the placenta. As Dr. Jennifer Conti, OBGYN and Stanford professor states, the rumors are based on fears that messenger RNA in the vaccine could cause infertility by accidentally attacking a protein in the placenta called Synthian 1, which has a sort of similar structure to the coronavirus spike protein. It's from this presented information that people can connect together to formulate an idea, um, and that's where the fear comes from. This is, in turn, what Hume focuses most of his inquiry on, the connection and formulation of thoughts. Starting off, Hume defines what it means to acquire knowledge or know something. For him, the material plays a major role in understanding the world around us. He discusses the need for material in his section on the origin of ideas. Within chapter two of his book, An Inquiry uh, Concerning Human Understanding, Hume divides perception of the mind into two separate categories. The first section, first category is thoughts or ideas. The other is perceptions. Uh, other type of perception is called an impression. To distinguish the two, Hume writes, the less forceful and lively are commonly denominated thoughts or ideas. By the term impression, then, I mean all are more lively perceptions when we hear or see or feel or love or hate or desire or will. For Hume, thoughts and ideas are aspects of the mind that can be joined together in ways to create something that has not been experienced. The example that Hume uses to illustrate this idea is the image of a golden mountain and a virtuous horse. Hume writes, when we think of a golden mountain, we can only join two consistent ideas, gold and mountain, which were, we are formerly acquainted. A virtuous horse we can conceive because from our own feeling, we can conceive virtue. And this we may unite to figure and the shape of a horse, which is an animal familiar to us. The key distinctive factor that Hume adds to the analysis of human understanding is that impressions or the experiences we have with material objects or agent. What this means is that Hume states that while aspects or modes can be combined within the mind to create things, a person has, has to have, have the impression or experience before they can start combining them. A person can imagine a virtuous horse or a golden mountain because they have experienced attributes of these objects in real life, even though the new idea or image is not as vivid as the one uh, as experienced, the mind is able to create something so akin to the thing that it seems possible. Another important aspect of understanding that Hume adds the emphasis, is the emphasis on the material. One of the problems that exists with acceptable view of knowledge is that it takes place, um, that it places the majority of its faith in what is in material. What this means is that the skeptical view will not rule out any possibility that the mind can reasonably make. 
Hume does not disagree that the mind and reason has its place in understanding. He believes in a recognition of its limits. Hume states the relation by writing this proposition that causes and effects are discoverable, not by reason, but by experience, will be readily admitted with regard to such objects. As we remember to have once all altogether unknown to us, since we must con since we must be conscious of the other utter inability, which we then lay under, of foretelling what would arise from them. Applying this precept to our situation, there's a distinct knowledge gap between the average person and those who are studying the virus. While every normal person has experienced what it's like to be sick and the effects thereof, medical professionals have experienced the relationships among viruses to a greater degree than we have. Stemming from Hume's analysis of the material, he then goes on to investigate the immaterial aspects of understanding and reason. He divides the object of human reasoning into two categories, which are relation of ideas and matters of fact. Relation of ideas deal with reasoning that can be purely immaterial, as they can be demonstrated or even intuitively known for certain. Hume's examples of objects of human reasoning are arithmetic and geometry. That the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the uh, square of two sides, and that three times five is equal to half a 30 are both examples he uses to illustrate this type. These objects of reasoning are able to be done and understood in the pure immaterial sense because in the absence of any material, they will still equal the same thing. Relation of ideas are able to exist without any physical representation, as Hume states, propositions of this kind are discoverable by the mere operation of thought without dependence on what is anywhere existent in the universe. Summarized, certain operations within the mind concerning the relations of ideas must be necessarily true, regardless of whether it exists in material form. The other type of human reasoning are matters of fact. This type of reasoning is required to have interaction with the material substance to understand it. It is not necessarily evident that it is true. He uses the example of the sun rising to illustrate this point. He writes, that the sun will not rise tomorrow is no less intelligible a proposition and implies no more contradiction than the affirmation that it will rise. What this passage serves to illustrate is that the experiences that we have with the material, though rational, are not necessary. Fear can start to grow if this is not solved. Connecting this back to the pandemic, the skeptical idea that the vaccine will not work is not wholly irrational. It stems from the fear that there is no necessity that it will work. There are many factors that people do not know, many possibilities of what could happen. So what is the solution to this problem? How does one ease the minds of the uncertain? The solution comes in the answer that Hume gives when he sees the rampant, rampant skepticism of his day, faith. In order to solve the doubts that come from not knowing the immaterial aspects of material objects, it's necessary to believe that the material connects to our understanding of the immaterial. Hume makes this point explicit by writing, we may observe in these phenomena, the belief of the correlative object is always presupposed without, the relate, without which the relation could have no effect. To illustrate this, Hume uses an image of fire. When he throws a log onto the fire, he immediately is reminded of other experiences with dry wood and fire. This in turn establishes the belief that it will not put out the fire, but in fact help, it, help keep it alive. This is why faith and belief are what Hume puts such a huge emphasis on. For Hume, nothing may be able to understand the scrutiny of dogmatic skepticism. It is only through belief in an object and agents will interact a certain way that we can be reassured that they will. So where does this leave us in the middle of a pandemic? Just as Hume prescribes belief to combat dogmatic skepticism, we should try to establish belief in those who have experience with viruses. It is experience only which gives authority to human testimony. And it's the same experience which assures us of the laws of nature. Is as true now as it was then. Let the experience of knowledge of those who have it speak for itself. As for us, let us work to support them. On the example of vaccine fears, let those who are skeptical wait. We can help by showing that we trust those by vaccinating. Be patient with the skeptics. It is only through belief that we can heal the fear they have. Thank you. Thanks, Trip. Nicely done. All right. Um, 
Okay, so let's uh, let's try this as a as a method for making this conversation work. Obviously, um, we can't just open the floor on Zoom because we'll have feedback issues and talk on top of each other and things like that. So unfortunately, we have to give ourselves a little more structure. Um, if you'd like to to uh, make a comment, ask a question, um, use the hand raise function. Um, that's either under reactions or participants. Apparently, they're different versions of Zoom, but in one place or the other, you'll have the option to raise your hand and that's your best way um, to, to get the floor. And if you raise your hand and recognize you, take your time, ask a question, make a comment. Um, as much as possible, let's try to find um, things to talk about that connect the papers, but it's obviously, it's fine to ask direct questions to any of our panelists as well. That, that's good. Um, if though, let's 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 innovate just a touch here. Uh, try to make it a little bit more organic. If someone has just said something that you would like to make a relatively brief response to, just physically raise your hand in front of the camera. Um, and uh, and as long as as we don't um, you know abuse that, I will let you jump uh, ahead of the people if we have any people that are in line, just so that we can have some continuity uh, in the conversation. So use the hand raise function to begin with, but if someone just said something that you'd like to respond directly to, just wave at me and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll bring you in immediately. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments that they'd like to kick us off with? Nick, please. Yeah, I just had like a, it's quite a general question actually for both Trip and Chandler uh, about like how you guys made the link between your, the things you were discussing and your cortex. Um, I don't know, particularly for Chandler because I thought it was a, you know, quite a <laughs> interesting link, but one that I think would be very difficult to make myself. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you guys maybe want to say a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so as it actually happens, uh, I'm an honor student in the, the Great Books program at St. Thomas University. And part of the expectation for that is that you write a, a, a thesis, an honors thesis. Um, and I'm doing mine on Gulliver's Travels and its, its relationship to Aristotle's politics uh, and, and despotism as such. Uh, and so it was, I just, it was just a matter of seeing what was going on in the world around me. And uh, first it was Aristotle. And then it was like, wait a second, Aristotle's connected to Gulliver's Travels in my thesis. So I can, I can connect it there. So there was, there was a clearly drawn line for me. And it was just a matter of, of realizing it in my case. Trip, before you jump in, let me, let me sort of um push a little bit on Chandler and Tripp, I, I definitely hope that you'll respond to Nick's question and Nick will follow up. So I, I don't want to derail these things, but um, I think Nick, for me, one thing that's, and this really does go, I mean, uh, Chandler, but this goes to Nick too, um, that, that, that has been, I guess, illuminating, but certainly problematic in the pandemic uh, related to some of these, these issues is, um, uh, is in the places that in the in the countries that have, uh, especially the United States, but not just the United States, that put a, a high sort of political premium on individual liberty, um, uh, who also rhetorically are um, and perhaps substantially committed to individual responsibility. Um, the the individual responsibility has not um, been sufficient. Um, to to contain the virus. In fact, um, places that um, and there's lots of lots of places have done different things to to respond to coronavirus to varying degrees of success. Um, but the places that have more central control <laughs> have uh, have in many cases done better than the places that have less central control. Um, and and so when you give this account. Uh, in Gulliver's Travels, Chandler, I mean, uh, read this paper to me 18 months ago, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm worried, this is a connection, I'm worried about the utopianism of waiting for a king like that, um, but I'm also uh, very eager to reject anything that sort of bends toward Toward, toward despotism as you, as you describe it. I don't think we have to go quite that dark, but, um, uh, but the pandemic has actually, I think, made the need for coordinated effort in certain situations clearer. 
and has made the um, the political um, obstacles to that, uh, especially in liberal democracies, um, more clear. And it, we're just going to sort of try to be um, honest and topical and, and serious here. I, I, I think that's it's something that I am trying to think through. And, and I wonder if, um, if, if any of you, but I'll start with Chandler, has anything to say about that. Yeah, and I, I guess something that I didn't have the opportunity to address in my paper is, is the, the virtues that are required for self-rule as well, right? That's not something that I had the opportunity to look at in respect to, respect to modernity, because uh, there's, like, like you suggest, there's, there's a level of responsibility that's, that's demanded. And I guess, I guess my point, my paper is more pointing at the fact that um, self-rule is not being practiced and not, the, not, not necessarily whether self-rule could be practiced, right? And that's, that's sort of the thing that I would like to highlight. So if you're somebody who maybe believes that like the virtues present in modern society now would enable us to maybe uh, practice some sort of self-rule. I think the, the handling of the pandemic would be quite concerning, right? Uh, as you suggested, if I had told you 18 months ago. Um, but I, if, if you're a little bit more skeptical of, of uh, the individual's uh, virtues in co contemporary times, I can certainly see the, the restraint from simply accepting that despotism is bad, right? So I'll just, I'll leave that there. Yeah, maybe I can also say something quickly about that. Um, I think also, you know, one of the things I was thinking about um, as you were um, speaking, Dr. Thomas, like about how I have no, one of the things I've noticed um, originally from England, from the UK, um, and I've noticed the difference in even just between the UK and the rest of Europe in how, for example, in response to the COVID pandemic, how like in a lot of countries in Europe, they are doing like a type US type system of having like regional areas being able to control to an extent their like, you know, rules. Um, whereas at least in the UK, that hasn't, it, everything's been like nationwide, like this is a nationwide rule for everyone. Um, and I notice as well, like how that through taking away, through not having that in-between level between like the state, the like countrywide rules and like the location specific rules, in some way it's like exactly like the, it's sort of stripping any opportunity to have any type of self-rule. Uh, and I wonder whether maybe that's the reason why at least in the UK we've had much less like sort of backlash to rules than in the, than in the rest of the Europe. Um, but yeah, no, I thought, yeah, Ch Chandler, your paper will maybe sort of think about that for myself. So that was yeah, really helpful. Thank you. Sorry, just to clarify, Nick, where has there been less backlash? There's been less backlash in the UK, you say? Yeah, well, like there hasn't, there, in, at least in, in Germany, for example, there's been lots of anti-lockdown protests. Um, whereas in the UK, like people have been remarkably uh, sort of servile to the rules in some way. Um, and I think that's not because there isn't frustration there, but more maybe because of this larger gap between, you know, how people, whether people can feel like they can self-rule um, or not. Uh, yeah. You know, as y'all have been talking, um, it sort of reminded me like why I wrote my paper. I mean, you asked like why I made the huge connection between Hume and COVID-19. Um, it, it seems to me like a very distinctive American thing that all of us are skeptics, um, that there is like something very interwoven in the American ideal of proving people wrong, um, that, there, that we are able to do something more, or there's something hidden that we're not telling us. And I really do think the COVID, uh, the like COVID nineteen, the pandemic, has sort of shot a hole in our armor, and sort of like seeing how this thinking has gone wrong. Um, the reason why I chose Hume and empiricism for it, because when anyone is, it comes up to me, um, and sort of like has a very distinctive distrust of government or like with the way that this COVID, like the pandemic has been handled, like their reaction to it. 
it always reminded me of like how Hume constructed, like how we attain knowledge. That ultimately it's our belief in things that um, sort of like drives how we connect things together. So it seems to me like the, the belief that this distrust of um, or like disconnect that Americans have with their government has sort of like driven probably to its extremes um, how skeptical they can really be. Um, and I just don't know. I, it, it's the fact that we have sort of like had a disjointed um, attack on COVID, if that makes sense. Um, I, I felt it was like really stretched apart, but it's just always for Hume for me. It, it seemed that skepticism for him just goes on forever. Like you can always ask another question that at some point you have to calm yourself down and say, we have to put our trust in something. Um, and I, I honestly think that if we are going to go forward and sort of like, especially like purely like an American thing, but across the, for everyone, there has, you have to put your trust back in people. Um, otherwise this fear is gonna lead to despotism. Um, Chandler, um, your whole paper, I was just thinking about that the whole time about how fear has sort of like driven people to extremes because even when Gulliver um, goes to the island, he's like immediately um, tied up. It's from this skeptical fear of like, oh, he's bigger than us. Um, he's obviously, we've seen things bigger than us attacked. So it, it's probably safer to just chain, uh, to tie him up and establish it now. Um, but yeah, that's where I sort of like have drawn my connection between Hume and COVID. Uh, Henry is next on the queue, but I, I must mention very briefly, Trip. you probably know this, but in case you don't remember it or any of you, you know, de Tocqueville says that Americans uh, haven't read Descartes, but they're all Cartesians <laughs> on instinct. Uh, and it's it's on this point of skepticism, uh, precisely that Tocqueville is, is talking. Uh, Henry. Yeah, so I thought, Trip, what you were talking about is really super interesting that um, and also just the general idea that we've kind of been discussing of sort of how fear leads to despotism and can lead to um, just that idea of um, surrendering to that fear and allowing it to control the society. And I think that um, skepticism is not always the root of that. Sometimes it can be the, the um, it, sometimes they can provide conflict against that and stand against that. I think that we don't ask questions always because we're afraid. Sometimes it is because we're afraid. But I think a lot of the times is we ask questions because we're smart. We're curious. We're built to be curious. We're built to figure things out and to invent new things. Um, but we're also built to ensure the safety of our friends and family. And so that's, that's what question asking is for a lot of people. And I feel like if the answers provided are not satisfactory, then there's a deeper problem to be looked at. Sometimes maybe on the part of the question asker, okay, why aren't these answers satisfactory to you? Like, why do you trust some science and not the other? Or sometimes it's, okay, maybe the answers aren't satisfactory. Now, in this specific case of COVID-19, the answers at this point should be satisfactory. But um, just in general, and then especially kind of in American politics, as we've kind of moved recently, I think, just the last, you know, nine, 10 presidents, our country has gotten progressively further from trusting the government because a lot of the times they've shown that they can't always be trusted. And so why, why, do we, why do we give them the blind faith that their predecessors have disgraced the office? So why do we give the new guy the blind faith? You inherit, you're a new president, but you inherit the legacy left behind by those before you, whether they were on the opposite side of the aisle from you or not. Um, and so I think that, that that's a huge part of it. And like, there's the government, right? And the people in the government are constantly changing. Some of them have been there a while, but that's still the, the idea that those things change. And even though they change, they stay the same. I, I, um, I, I agree with you that there is sort of like, there is a danger of blind faith and putting too much um, to the point of like becoming naive. Um, but the part that I really focusing on um, 
within my paper is sort of like this idea of rampant skepticism, um, taking the political out of it. Um, when we are focused on organizations like CDC and doctors who have experience with these things, um, there has to be a level of trust. You have to, there has to be a level of belief that the degrees that they have are, are real and that they are prepared for this. When it comes to a solely political thing, when we are like talking about changing of presidents, in a sense for a democracy to work, you have to put a level of faith in the people who are put in office. Um, while there have been definitely actors and there are that have shown like they cannot be trusted, um, it needs to be taken on a person by person basis. I mean, it shouldn't, it is not the institution itself that um, breeds distrust, but it's the people that we put in. So there has to be, it's good to question things. Like that, that's one of the beauty of, of skepticism that I love so much. And that is really great about what's woven into the American ideal. We are all Cartesians, we are all skeptics, which is not bad on its own, but there is a point where you have to trust the people around you. Um, and, and that's really all I have to say on that. Uh, Professor Honeycutt, are you uh, back there behind your screensaver? Would you like to speak? Yeah, I've stolen a moment of solace from uh, chasing a two-year-old running rampant around my house. Uh, I um, I thought all three papers were great. I think um, uh, I like that Dr. Thomas brought up uh, the point about Tocqueville. I mean, it's the method of the Americans, right? It's what Tocqueville says. And he locates it not just in Descartes, but in Voltaire and Luther, too, that he says it's the same thing running through all those thinkers that it's not that Americans read these things. So that's what's particularly interesting, maybe at a Cortex conference. It's not that they read Descartes or, you know, uh, but it's somehow soaked in that it's insensible, though perhaps not indelicate on the part of the Americans, um, that they're, they're Cartesian skeptics, we might say. Um, but what does that mean? And what is, I guess, in the context of all three papers, I, I guess my question on the table is how do we, uh, what's the appropriate way to ask questions, maybe. Um, I mean, as Hume points out, I, th I think Tripp was getting at this, there's no real rational warrant for any of our beliefs, ultimately. And so um, when we ask questions and we interrogate the world, especially in times of crisis, when it seems really important to get answers right, um, what is it that we should have faith in, right? Is it faith in authority? Is it faith in reason? Is it faith in evidence. Um, in other words, what is it that we're supposed to believe? Um, Hume calls himself a kind of skeptic. Uh, and so what type of skepticism would be appropriate? And not just for Hume, but I think as a theme running through all of the three papers, I mean, I, have, uh, I think Nick pointed out early in his paper that um, the quote, quotation from Oscar Wilde that, uh, I mean, utopia means nowhere. But of course, uh, if we're not always really looking for it, then there's some kind of problem. And so um, what would it mean to look for better answers? Uh, and what is it that we can trust, especially if we can't trust uh, reason itself? I'm glad that you um, pointed that out because there is a part of Hume that I did not get because it's sort of like interwoven in his response to the, um, to like the religious experience of Descartes. It's that custom sort of like uh, directs where we put our beliefs. Um, and I just thought that would be like a really great part to, that I, I wanted to include in my paper. But I just don't think I got around to. Uh, Mason, you're, you're next on the queue. And of course, you can ask anyone any question you want or make any comment you like. But I would love to, to circle back to, the, to Nick's utopian method. Um, if anyone has questions about that, please get on the queue or you'll have to listen to me some more. Uh, Mason, you're up. Sure, yeah. Um, well, my question's for Chandler, and full disclosure, we're at the same institution. I was in the class where this paper was first devised. So, um, but the the part where the part of the argument that I thought was so striking, or I guess Swift's analysis of these things that's so striking, is that the tyrannical people are the Lilliputians who are smaller both in body and soul than the um. Uh, Brobdingnagians, you know, this, this sort of 
like immediately this this sort of makes sense but on the other hand you think wouldn't the stronger be the ones that have um tyrannical desires not the weaker um and so i just um like i, I just wanted maybe you to um spell out why why fear would be a a, a reason for uh, tyrannical desires or or a political a despotic form of politics that's a tough question and it's it's hard to go beyond just that it does um instead i'll try uh, it's uncomfortable right being vulnerable um and that's that's kind of the direction i'd like to go is that if 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 you're in a position of vulnerability as as Gulliver found himself in the land of Brobdingnagians where he was perpetually fighting off physical harms, let alone psychological ones because of these these people really making him question everything that he knows. Um, he's uncomfortable there, right? And in order for him to find any any sort of uh, solace in his own he, he it's it's hard for him to accept what he is in that moment as as maybe as maybe the inferior right i'm not going to even say the inferior as maybe the inferior where there's the opportunity for it so instead he he desires to uh put himself forward as like no like i'm going to prove not just to myself now but everyone else that i am actually the superior being here right that to the, the lilliputians when they confront gulliver that you know like this 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 thing's not the superior being we are the superior beings and we'll prove that by subduing him so that's that's as if that makes sense hopefully yeah no that, that was great yeah professor whitfield so I, i'll jump in on the utopian question and christine de pizan uh for nick uh, one of the things that i really intrigued. I, I, I have to tell you, I read that text just this year for the first time. And um, so in the beginning, as, as Christina de Pisan is in despair over what she has read, um, the, the ladies who appear to her are, um, are reason and rectitude and justice. Um, I, I'd like you to reflect a little bit on, um, on their appearance perhaps on their relationship to each other, um, but also how that fits in with your um, sense of uh, the function of, of methodology and analysis uh, in terms of the way that, that their appearance uh, sets up some of what you were arguing. Yeah, thank you for the question. And yeah, I also would say uh, just a, a bit of uh, background information on my paper. Um, it, I'm working on it for my thesis. So um, this is a very initial paper. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm still going through that. So it's really helpful to have any comments you guys may have. Um, but yeah, I think it, indeed, like seeing these three sort of ladies come to Christine and like a, help her out, I think. I think the whole thing is like, like I, was, I was getting on this sort of rhetoric, the use of utopianism as rhetoric. Um, and I think that, you know, these, these three ladies, they are in a way, they're sort of these guides for Christine and they are, she, she in a way takes the, the, her own autonomy out of the text in some weird way by giving it or transferring it to these three external people who at the end of the day, if we take a step back are also her, um, they're coming through her thought. And I think again, like as a method, as part of her methodological use of utopianism, it's all about like creating distance in some strange way between her, Christine herself and what she is saying. Um, at least that's, that's my sort of my take. And I think that these three ladies are a perfect example of exactly how Christine is removing herself from the um, sort of from the creation of this city in a weird way 
at least in part, by sort of offloading some of our responsibility to these people. Um, and I don't know, in, in my sense, that's when it comes to utopianism in a more general sense, I think that is one of the benefits. Like you're, you, the people creating these um, sort of fictional situations, in some way they are removing themselves, they are removing the individual and instead sort of providing them with a, a guide who is telling them what to do and giving them advice about what is the best solution. But that guide is also coming from them. Um, I know that, yeah, maybe I didn't answer exactly your question, but uh, yeah, no, thank you for, for bringing it up because it's definitely something I'd like to look into more. Thanks, that was, that was helpful. I, I, I guess my other quick question is, um, in, in what ways do, perhaps does that draw on um, Hebrew Bible ideas of, of lady uh, wisdom uh, as uh, this uh, correlate with the divine um, that, that allows her to draw on the feminine as a source of wisdom and instruction. Um, I just sort of lay that out as a possibility. I would love to have a conversation about this with you because I myself am not familiar <laughs> with, uh, with this, but uh, no, one of the reasons why I sort of wanted to come at this early stage in the writing process to this um, conference is because I think there is so much to relate it to. Um, so yeah, no, I, I'll definitely like to look into that further. Yeah, I'll be um, glad to talk with you about it. Thanks. Thanks. Trip. My question, or somewhat more of a comment um, for Nick, um, I, first of all, I've never read this book, but by the way you describe it, it sounds amazing. Um, but I'm really interested on what you see sort of like her analysis of like utopia, sort of like as an analytical or not so much as like a, a, a not a destination, but a journey. Um, I, don't know, I just wanted to hear, because I've never read the book, um, how are the interactions um, with people within the book? Because it seems, it seems to me like I was definitely connecting this back to my paper, one, because I'm a narcissist, but two, um, I, I was just wondering like how people's interactions within like the, the city that she makes, um, sort of like the belief that they're doing things, that, that what they're doing is good and sort of like they're creating a topia. Um, it reminds me of like Kant's kingdom of ends, like how everyone sort of like the interactions that they have with people sort of creates a utopia and it's not the institution itself, but it's sort of like the way that we treat each other. Um, I just wanted to hear more um, since you've read it and you know about it. Um, what are the interactions with the people in the book? Like what is going on there? Yeah, well, I think it's a yeah, really nice question. Thank you. I, I think one of the sort of beautiful things about the pit text, which I picked up on, um, compared to the other sort of core utopian texts, take, for example, Thomas More's Utopia, um, is that it's very much the book is a journey. It's a journey for Christine um, in her interactions with people. Um, uh, uh, as Professor Whitfield mentioned, there is these three ladies that, that come to Christine and in that sense, the whole work is a development of a city. Um, and in, in addition, there's a whole, I mentioned it as well, there's a whole host of these prominent women uh, over the whole of human history, um, authors, poets, uh, and the whole journey, the whole book is a, is a journey uh, for creating, it's a discussion for creating, you know, what would be, how would this city of ladies look? Um, and I think one of the interesting things for me is if you compare this to, for example, Moore's Utopia, Moore's Utopia reads, at least in my mind, much more as being like, a, this is how it will be. This is it. I've thought it up and here we go. Here it is. Take it, take it as you as you will. Um, and I think, yeah, in terms of how she goes about it, about building the city of ladies, it's very much more an exploratory journey um, it, through discussing with these, these sort of guides, which she has. Um, and sort of, yeah, targeting each issue or each question one by one. Um, so, yeah, I would really recommend reading it, even if you don't read the whole thing, just reading one, you know, the beginning section is, is really, yeah, quite insightful. 
I'd like to, oh, Emma, please, you, you get to go before me, but I have questions for Nick too. P please, Emma. I just wanted to make a brief comment because um, I also discovered Pisan quite recently, uh, I think two years ago, my students like it. Um, I, I've not read it with Nick, but I'm reading it with my current students. And, um, and I think that my sense of it is that she's so um, immersed in a way in the, the classical and, and biblical tradition, uh, very uh, learned in a way about it as well. I mean, if we just, you know, uh, step aside a bit of what, what, what Nick was saying, I think uh, one way in which she gains authority is to, to be humble about it. So to say, well, it's not really me, but it's Lady Reason who's whispering in my ear to, not to feel afraid to tell the story. Um, but I think uh, it, it's really interesting, and I think it's also interesting uh, for Americans because maybe you are all skeptics, but but that might mean that you need a little bit more <laughs> utopia or more imagination. And I think what what she's doing, um, uh, she's she's gaining a certain kind of authority. But I think rhetorically the text works really well because her world was people. Maybe today uh, we don't know who King Solomon was anymore in some places, but her world would have known it. And it, it was also very popular because this all resonated. And at the same time, the book also is uh, in a way very uh, tantalizing and funny because she you know, turns the world upside down. And now, now it's only women. Um, one question, but I, I'm not sure if, if anyone, Nick or maybe Brian, what I wonder is, as far as I know, she doesn't bring in the, um, the ecclesiastical order into the city. Um, and, and so that, that's sort of a little bit in the back of my mind. And maybe she's doing that not to challenge the church, which was a very much a male, or maybe that was pushing it too far. I'm not sure. But she, you know, she makes up or she appeals to all sorts of other myths and she sort of rewrites them sometimes a little bit. So um, that would, yeah, that was sort of, that's a small question that's lingering in the back of my mind. But I think she's, uh, she's using all of these women from the traditions in part because it was giving her text, um, uh, yeah, because of the rhetorical force of it, I guess. Nick or Brian, do either of you want to comment on that? I think the interesting thing as well is that I've also come to the text very recently. Um, so we have no experts, and I'm guessing, in the, well, absolute experts. Um, but yeah, I mean, initially on, on that point, um, I think uh, it, it may be this whole point of it being too far. In some way, it does, it really walks the line of being you know, at some point you sort of distinguish lines which are, you know, a bit not sure how they would be appreciated. Um, and I don't know, I wonder whether maintaining that sort of distance in some sense by using these sort of women of, of the traditions in which, um, you know, around, I think that uh, a lot of it is about distance, at least for me. I felt like there's a lot of times where, you know, there's a, there's, there's there's more distance between Christine and what she's saying and then there's a lot of times where there's less and I, I wonder maybe whether that was just a point of her being uh, you know not wanting to become too close but then maybe uh, Professor Whitfield has another idea. No I, I think there is something there that I, I she does have some of the early Christian women but that seems to be sort of a line that she she draws, she doesn't come that close to her own time. Um, the other thing that that strikes me, my, my students were, um, some of my students were very disturbed by the focus on uh, women uh, who practice chastity and and that, that Christine doesn't, even though she herself had been married, doesn't seem to make as much space in the city for um, for married women or women who are involved uh, sexually, and so uh, there there maybe are some parallels in that sense to um, 
women who in, are in orders in the Middle Ages, uh, and this valorization of, of chastity. Um, but but I, I think Nick's right that, that perhaps part of the reason she doesn't come up to the present day with her examples is a way of providing that distance. And as you suggested, perhaps to give her some cover from, from being too critical of the institutions of her own day, including the church. I'd like to, this is fascinating. Um, I, I, I'd like to ask a, a, bit, a little bit, we can return to the other papers too now, we've, we've kind of bit the reed, but, uh, but I'm sticking uh, Utopia for another moment and, and keep Nick on the hot seat. Um, I was really struck by this um, uh, juxtaposition of Levitas and uh, and Gray, and the um, uh, and, and the sense in which in your account and I think in actuality uh, that they 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 agree in a sense that um, uh, that there's a kind of revolutionary quality to Utopias that and and Gray is opposed to it. Uh, because uh, it, it offends some sort of conservative understanding of, of political social orders being organic, such that if one um, overturns them in, in a radical way, it, it does um, uh, violence um, that, that isn't justified and perhaps isn't productive. Uh, but uh, insofar as, as Levitas doesn't resist the, the Marxian um, uh, identification, um, she is to some extent agreeing with with that, right? That there's um, that not not to the not to the condemnation of revolution, but to the association of of utopianism with revolution, which, depending on how Marxian she is, uh, she might she might embrace. And so, when your paper kind of came around to this idea that we can return to these. Um, this, this utopian literature of Christine and, and I would say perhaps others um, that is, is sort of pre-politicization of, of utopias um, that allow for more scale, that, it, um, that it, it's not about either uh, rejecting utopias entirely or um, accepting them as, as revolutionary, but there being something uh, some way of the utopian literature or the utopian process uh, being more oriented to, and this is my language now, to reform than, than revolution. Um, I find that fantastic and fascinating. And it, I guess I have two questions. Um, the first is, because um, you've already, and, and you sort of opened the door to this, but it's okay if you close it. Uh, is, do you think that, that Moore's utopia can, um, can also be sort of pulled into this account of a, of a, of, of a utopia that can, um, can lend itself to reform rather than, um, than to revolution? Because, um, and, and I'll put my cards on the because if it can, then I would argue they all can, right? All the way back to, to Plato and wherever else you want to look for utopias. And if that's the case, and this is sort of my second question, um, then, then this extremism of Levitas and, and Gray, either yes, utopian revolution or no utopias, but agree that it's because it's revolutionary, that this is perhaps a, a modern problem, that it's not the problem of, of utopias or utopian writers, it's the problem of 20th century readers of utopias that insist they have this sort of um, character that doesn't allow for scale. I just wonder what you think of that. Yeah, no, there's a super interesting insights. Um, I think on the first one, actually, about just your initial reactions to the whole idea of this Levitas versus Gray type of thing, it's really strong. It, it's slightly disturbing in some sense, actually, when you read these utopian scholars. Um, one of the, there's this institute in, in Ireland, actually, the Limerick Institute for Utopian Studies. And basically, it's become, yeah, it's a bit of a sort of a hub for utopian scholarship, but it is. Uh, you know, it's it's been has very close ties to Michael Higgins, the former president of or current president of Ireland, and you know it has a lot of ties to communism and like to Marxist theory. Uh, and in that sense, it's you know everything that comes out has some sort of 
lean or you know nothing escapes that political dimension in some sense um so yeah that would yeah like you said that was one of the reasons why i, I wanted to return to to christine um and i think yeah on the more point um I mean, the general view, my general view of Moore's utopia is, and I, I come to this also in, in the sort of larger paper that I'm writing, that it in some sense seems more ideological than Christine de Pizan, because it is like this idea that this is my order. I've created this order in, this is my utopia. This is the end, this will be the end form of society. There is nothing, it's sort of this ideology ending ideology, I call it. Uh, like, you know, it's not a very nice way of saying it, but it's, this final ideology. Um, and so in that sense, it is like you said, it's, it's, it's a complete utopianism and it is not, it doesn't allow for, it doesn't really allow for any sort of, you know, realism in some sense. And I think that, you know, I think that, that the question, the factor of scale when you bring it in actually makes the whole text a lot more appealing and useful in some way the idea that you can take some things that more mentions and you know maybe think about those in a utopian way but then not be completely like in line with what he's saying i think that you know really for me that that speaks sort of leagues in terms of how i would like to uh, do my own thinking um so yeah i know i didn't get too much into the more example because i'm not too like sort of well versed in it um, but thank you for the last, for the question. I hope that gave some clarification or insight. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was very helpful. Uh, Kevin, Professor Honeycutt. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, in a way, I think this reaches back to Chandler's paper as well and the question that Mason asked about it. Um, a thinker that I have spent a great deal of time on, uh, Bertrand de Juvenel, says in one of his books that there is tyranny in the womb of every utopia. And the question is, what does that mean, right? It doesn't mean like as such um, tyranny must develop uh, in every utopia or just that uh, tyranny can develop. I mean, in some sense, the weaker claim is true but trivial, uh, but I guess um, how <laughs> I was struck Mason's question. In other words, uh, you have a, not, not that perhaps uh, the island is a utopia in a strict sense, but um, how does utopia emerge? In other words, is, is it always just uh, a ferocious appetite for power or something? Or, or what is it about um, fair visions of the good that might uh, poison the heart, as Juvenel says, uh, against others, whether we are big or small? Um, and because uh, I, I, will, I will in the chat link to an article that Juvenel wrote, it's called Utopia for Practical Purposes, where he discusses more and some other people, and Nick may be interested in taking a look, so I'll just post it for the good of the order. But then to just put that question on the table, this must, must uh, a utopia, this gets at Dr. Thomas's question of scale, I guess, um, must it lead to revolution or to tyranny or to some nefarious end, or is there a, uh, a way that we can use since Tripp brought up Kant earlier, a way, way to use visions of utopia as, as like models that we can make slow, steady steps toward. Yeah, and, uh, thank you for the question. And I think actually I would, I'm gonna try and sort of do it so that actually it will lead on to also Chandler uh, and, and Tripp. Um, Cause one of the things that I I have sort of seen in the, in the utopian tradition is that there seems to be this sort of distrust in people and how they will handle utopias when they're written. So it's not so such like the, paper, the, the, the writing itself, but it's more like, oh no, what will happen when this gets into the hands of people that either don't understand it or, you know, that's, it's not just in utopian tradition, it's also in, you know, uh, we look in the past hundred years, that's been a, a big problem. And I think in terms of, it actually made me think of like self-governance, the idea that you know, it's definitely a danger, utopias can be very dangerous and that's being recognized by a lot of people. And in such, there has to be a, a degree of trust of the people to, you know, to be able to govern themselves and to be able to govern you, any type of utopian thinking um, in a sensible way. Uh, and I think, 
you know, my, uh, my thinking was about, uh, it makes me think of Machiavelli, um, who, you know, was so keen for that not to sort of not to have this sort of any sort of space for um, utopian thought in some way. And I wonder whether, at least uh, in the prints, it, it reads as being some sometimes a bit of a distrust of the people and how they will, you know, if left free and free of tyranny, how they will deal with it. Um, so I don't know, maybe that, yeah, maybe that helps link on to either Chandler or Trip or, uh, yeah. We have about nine minutes left. So yeah, Chandler, sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. Please, please take the floor. But uh, this is the time if we haven't um, broached a topic that you were interested in or you've held back because you didn't see an obvious transition from what you, we were talking about to what you were interested in, it's time to stop worrying about that and just uh, get in here because we're about to run out of time. But please, Chandler, go ahead. Yeah, and I guess something that I didn't get to include in my paper was uh, Swift's account of a sort of utopia realized in the form of the Winhams, which is ultimately the regime that Gulliver decides, like, this is it. Uh, it's, it's a horse people, a noble animal, of course, and they, they rule over a bunch of yahoos, which are uh, humanoids obsessed with golden rocks. Uh, <laughs> and in her paper on the Winhams, uh, Mary Nichols kind of compares it to uh, Plato's Republic, the city in the Republic, where the guardians have gold in their souls. And so they're, or the myth, they, they make a myth where the guardians have gold in their souls. And so it gives them like a sort of right to rule over everyone else. And I guess uh, in, in, the, in their treatment of the, the yahoos, the huenums, and maybe this speaks to the, the despotic nature of utopia realized <laughs> in a way, uh, they aren't particularly kind to the Yahoos and they, they treat them quite fiercely. And it's, I, I think uh, a utopian rule that uh, does not take into account a, a sort of self rule in its formulation, I think might necessarily become despotic. So just, I just wanted to say that uh, Utopia Realized is, uh, is a conversation piece in Gulliver's Travels as well. Any final questions or comments? Okay. Uh, well, this has been a fantastic panel. I'm so impressed uh, with, with all of the papers and with the conversation and uh, uh, really appreciate everyone's um, thoughtfulness and uh, uh, conviviality and, and effort. So, uh, so thank you, thank you to everyone. Um, we uh, we will we will conclude here in just a second. Um, but there are uh, two panels at uh, eleven. Um, you guys at this point clearly know where to find them. Uh, and then we will break for lunch uh, and reconvene for one panel at one fifteen, and then the a brief closing session at three o'clock. So uh, we just got started, but we're, we're also about at the halfway point, I think, um, in the next session. So I hope to see you guys, uh, if not in one of the uh, next sessions, at least in the, in the closing session at three. Um, and if you have any issues, technical or otherwise, between now and then, I'm definitely the one uh, to look for. So, uh, so thanks, everyone. Thank you for moderating as well. It was really nice. Yeah. Okay. See you. See you soon. Bye.